All right, well, we are in Philippians 2, 12 through 18 this morning. I'm going to read this text all the way through. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. God, we just pray that today your word would bring life to our physical bodies, healing to our emotions, um, the knowledge of God to our mind and intellect, and the love of God to our heart. We praise in Jesus' name. As we read this passage, I think one of the questions that comes to my mind is, what is the will of God for my life? And this is probably a pretty frequent question that people ask as Christians, what is the will of God for my life? And we, um, we ask this about marriage, about relationships, especially when we're younger. Um, we ask it about, was, is it the will of God that I get married? Or is it the will of God that I marry Jenny or Susan or, well, Holly? Was the will of God for me? And we pray and we acquire God's, real, uh, God's will, uh, requiring how we should live or where we should live, whether we should move, whether we should stay, where we should go. And I think when we're young, uh, we often wonder about what God's will is for our career. And maybe some of you in here, since you're older, you are still wondering that. And maybe you, you didn't get it right the first time, and so you are actually wondering, what career should I be about? And so a lot, oftentimes we think of God's will in terms uh, of those arenas of life. Uh, but... If you were to come and ask me, well, what do you think the will of God for me is, I think uh, you'd be pretty disappointed in my answer because I'm going to say I have no idea what the will of God is for you in those areas of your life. But if we really are serious about wanting to know the will of God, we don't need to go any further than to heed the words of 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, which says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Well, what is sanctification? Um, in, in theology, sanctification is a word that describes the process of lifelong obedience of a believer that leads to growth in Christ's likeness or Christ's image. And in the Greek New Testament, the root of the word for sanctification is the basis for the words holiness Consecrate, which is to treat something as holy or set apart. The word purify and saint, which means God's holy ones. And to be sanctified means to be made holy. This charge of Paul to the Philippians, to the Philippian church, to work out your salvation has become maybe a quintessential verse when it when it comes to describing sanctification, and in it we actually see the relationship of the sovereignty of God and the human responsibility, our responsibility, after salvation. And so it's a, a good beginning point if you're unfamiliar with the idea of sanctification in Scripture. Uh, but before we get into the text this morning, I, I think to better understand what Paul's trying to communicate in Philippians 2 here, I think we really need to look back at what Colton was preaching about last week, which um, 
Paul begins the charge in this verse when he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says, therefore, meaning in light of what he just said, work out your salvation. Continue in obedience. And so continue growing in consistency and depth in your obedience. And the therefore is pointing to something that precedes this command that Paul is giving that is an incentive or a reward for them continuing in obedience. And I think it's important that we go and look at what is it saying, because if the word therefore appears, we need to go back and see what is the therefore, therefore. Last week, Colton said that all of Philippians was heading towards or funneling into the passage that we read last week, and everything after it is flowing out of it. As we look back at these verses, I would encourage you, would you look for the connections and the associations and the repetition of the ideas that Paul's drawing our attention to in these verses. So what precedes verse 12, verses 9 through 11, where he says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So is Paul saying that because Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God, powerful, perfect in holiness, and infinitely glorious, and to Him every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, Lordship, because Because of this, therefore, obey and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I think he could be saying that. But the statement I just read there from those verses uh, also start with a therefore. So we really need to go back and see what that's connecting to. And so as we look back at the beginning of the chapter, we see in verse 2, and if you just look there real quick, In verse 2 and verse 5, where Paul is commanding them to live in humility by being of one mind and to have, in verse 5, the mind of Christ. He says, in verse 5, he says, have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What does he mean by have one, have the mind of Christ? He illustrates it in the hymn, of verse, the magnificent hymn of verse 5 through 11. And it begins with the, it, with, it actually begins with Christ in eternity, and it ends with Christ in eternity, exalted and glorified at the right hand of the Father. And it describes the, hu- the extreme humility, or the supreme humility, rather, of God, who in verse 6 was, says, was in the form of God and emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being found in human form. So Jesus, having been equal with God for all eternity, emptied himself of aspects of his divine glory that according to John 17, verse 5, when he's praying, he says he had with the Father before the world existed. He emptied himself of those glories that he had, and he took on human form in the likeness of his own creation. And he took that on for eternity. He took on human form, not just here. He rose in human form, and when we see him, he will be in human form. And I think the crucial, the crucial question, or the vital question for us here is what did Jesus do by taking on two natures, divine and human? His divine nature and his human nature. What did he do while he had those natures here on earth? And so the answer to this question, I think, gives us a key to understanding the nature of God and how he desires for us to live in light of who 
he is, or rather, what he did. And so first, he humbled himself, verse 5 says, by counting us more significant than himself, even though we're clearly not worthy of being rescued. We're not worthy of his suffering. We're not worthy of his death. But he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We didn't deserve it, and he did it anyways. And we... um, So he was actually covenanting with himself from all eternity to redeem and rescue man. The Father sent the Son into the world. And the Son, by taking on human form and living in obedience, bore our sins and took the Father's full wrath and justice. So what was he doing as he humbled himself, emptied himself, took on human form, became in the the likeness of a servant, the likeness of man, He was doing what Paul charges the Philippians to do, which is, in the beginning of the chapter, count others more significant than yourselves. We didn't deserve it, but he did it anyways. So Jesus' whole life really can be summed up in obedience from his conception to his death. And so, Paul follows all of that with, therefore, as you have always obeyed, he's commending them, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And from this chapter and throughout the redemptive narrative, we see clearly that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit have been active in their role in salvation. And sal- um, salvation lovingly begins and is initiated by God, not by us. We see that in this hymn. And so when we look at the work of salvation throughout the New Testament, and specifically in the New Covenant, we see several key elements or teachings that are important, I think, to have a more complete understanding of salvation. We'll never know it uh, as deeply as we possibly can, which is why we'll marvel at it for eternity. But in the New Testament, we see the miracle of new birth or regeneration. You see that in John 3. You see it in Titus 3, chapter 5, uh, verse 5. You see... Uh, The idea of calling, where the Holy Spirit is convicting and convincing a person of sin and their need for Jesus, their need for this servant who took human form, the divine man. You see conversion, we see uh, in Mark 1.15, where it points to when a person actually receives salvation, the moment of receiving it. You see faith and repentance are mentioned as conditions of salvation, And repentance is turning from self to sin and turning to God in his ways and holiness. And faith, repentance or faith and faith are requirements of salvation, Scripture teaches. And so faith is believing the historical facts about Jesus and trusting him alone to forgive sins and grant eternal salvation. So the promise of salvation is eternal life with Jesus. And we also see something called justification, which is uh, the result of believing in the gospel and the truth of who Christ is and trusting him. But when that happens, um, the sinner is declared, a sinner is declared uh, not guilty before God. And so, by trusting in Jesus alone for salvation, the righteousness of Christ is imputed or it's credited to the sinner. 
So God now treats the sinner in light of the righteousness of Jesus. And so just as Adam imputed sin and guilt to us, Jesus, when we are declared justified and declared righteous, God imputes or transfers the righteousness of Jesus to us when we believe. And then we also see sanctification, which is when a, when a sinner is declared holy um, or they receive salvation, there's a definitive beginning where they are not free from sin in this life, but they're free from the penalty of sin. And Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit indwells a sinner at that moment of conversion. And it's at that point where a lifelong process of growing into Christ's likeness begins. So in other words, uh, a saint may not, not, may not actually behave as a saint. <laughs> and so Scripture teaches that a, believer, uh, that a believer's salvation is eternally secure, and it's a free gift. It cannot be lost. Um, God initiates salvation. And God preserves the salvation through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And God will not fail on his promise. Now all these teachings, I think, they find their, um, we, we find in the, new, in the pages of the New Testament, of all of them, I think two uh, that are easily confused are justification and sanctification. And so both of them deal with the righteousness of the believer. Paul is saying here, work out your salvation. Continue obeying. And so justification is the legal standing someone has before God. And just as Adam, I said, Adam imputed sin to his descendants, so Christ, the second Adam, or the last Adam, imputes or transfers his righteousness to his dependents that are adopted by him through God's promise. And so justification happens once and for all time. And it, it's in Scripture def, described as entirely the work of God. You have no part in it. He does it all. And so at the moment of salvation, a person is declared to have Christ's righteousness and perfection in this life. And so it's the same for all Christians, justification. When a person is justified, one Christian is justified, another person who believes in Christ is justified in the same manner. They have right standing with God, the removal of guilt, the transfer of Christ's righteousness onto their life. And so Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Um, but now, righteousness of God has been manifested, oh, sorry, this is Romans. Romans 3, 21 through 24 says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, sanctification as well has to do with the believer's personal righteousness and holiness. However, unlike the positional righteousness the believer has through justification or their right standing, sanctification is the practical righteousness of a believer in Christ, and in this life, how it affects how they should live or determines how they should live and grow. And so to be sanctified means, as I said, to be made holy. And it's a process that begins at the moment of salvation. But unlike justification, when one person is justified and another is justified, it's the same. But in sanctification, there's a, di there's a difference between the Quality, the quantity, uh, I don't know if you could say the quantity, um, the speed of sanctification, the depth 
in the fullness of sanctification. So we see God working in the life of believers in different ways, at different levels, at different depths. And so really sanctification, for me, has always been a mystery. Um, it's very mysterious. And so I've really, been really encouraged as, we've, as I've studied through this passage. So when you become a crawler, uh, uh, sorry, when you become a, a follower of Christ, you don't instantly become holy. Now, when you're justified, you have right standing, and you become holy and righteous in God's sight. But then, uh, this is one of the biggest problems we face as believers, because when I receive salvation, I still sin. But our lives should change, and we should be growing toward and pressing on towards conformity to the image of Christ. Sanctification is that lifelong obedience which leads us to growth in Christ's likeness. And it's a gradual conformity to the image of God. From glory to glory, as Paul says, we behold him and we become like him. We're renewed in our mind and our inner being and we display the character of God. One of the first things God said after delivering the Egyptians, I'm sorry, delivering the Israelites out of Egypt in Leviticus 11:45, he says, when delivering them out of Egypt, he said, "For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God." You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Paul addresses, um, also we see in the New Testament, Paul addresses the churches in his letters and Peter as saints, which the English translation already said means holy ones. And so God is not finished Oh, oh! by the time Paul has not even finished greeting them as holy ones, like, say, the church of Corinth, um, before he can even get far in his letter, he's immediately chastising them and telling them to stop sinning. That's kind of ironic. Hey, ho you're holy ones. Hey, holy ones, stop sinning. And so we see this contradiction in sanctification. Sanctification is not optional for the believer. But Paul knows it's a work in progress. And there is work. So he says, work out your salvation. It involves work. But what does Paul mean by work? Well, let's define what it doesn't mean. Um, this is not working for or earning salvation, because that would be a workspace righteousness, which is in direct, uh, direct opposition to what Paul says later on. And if you'll look over to chapter 3, verse 9, he says he desires to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes from, oh, sorry, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. So he doesn't mean working for his own Salvation. When he says work out your salvation, it's not earning. It's not your working doesn't earn anything. You can't do anything. Otherwise, you he wouldn't make the statement, I want his righteousness. So rather it's working. Like maybe what he means by working instead is it's working out that which God has already worked into you. And so it's making the salvation that was accomplished by Christ fruitful in the here and the now, in this present world. And it involves, and this involves sustained effort. It involves endurance. And that, that's why Paul says in chapter 3.12, he says, not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. A believer who's united with Christ and who's positionally justified before God will demonstrate that relationship with increasing 
practice uh, practical holiness throughout their life. And so I think it's important to see that this working is set within the context also of obeying. Because he, I, I used to think of these as two different things. Uh, you've obeyed, work out your salvation. But I think Paul is really saying the same thing. As you have always obeyed, work out your salvation. And so, uh, since in verse 5, Paul had just said, since Christ had this mind, emptying himself, taking the form of a servant, humbling himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, as you've always obeyed, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Simply put, working out your salvation means following the example and the pattern of obedience that Christ gave us. And so what was that pattern? I think we see it clearly. Jesus states it in Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Even Paul, Paul's command to work seems at some point not just uh, to the personal, but also there's a corporate dimension. So when Jesus says he came to serve, when Paul says, work out your salvation, Paul says, work out your salvation, and he actually uses a plural form of the word work. So he's, by doing that, I think that what uh, Paul has in mind is the idea that a community church, the church is obeying together as their lives are shared among one another, and what that builds is it builds social harmony and peace in a way that reflects the character of God through the whole church, the whole community. So, if this working seems uh, daunting, I think the encouraging verse is verse 13, because it says, for it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And just as God was at work in salvation, he's also at work in sanctification. And I would say that just as God is sovereign in salvation, he's also sovereign in sanctification. God, is empow God empowers and enables us to, and enables us, and he enables you to desire and actually do the work that pleases him. And so he's not just strengthening our willingness he's not, or our acting. He's actually himself working in us to act. And somewhere at the deepest levels of our will and actions. And we see this in Colossians 1.9. Paul says, For this I toil, struggle with all all his energy that powerfully works within me. You hear that? We hear that meddling, the mixture of the two. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. He says something very similar in, similar in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15.10. He says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God within me. So somewhere underneath our working is God's sovereign working, his will and his pleasure in our life. And so as Paul did, we should also have all the more resolve to will and to act in a way that pleases our master just as Jesus was obedient and humble to his father. So just take a minute to breathe that in. I, I think um, 
the fact, the reality that God is at work in the will, is at work in your doing, where you go, when you go to work, when you speak with people, when you are alone. Somehow God is working in order to make you holy. And it's His work. But yet, we're still commanded to obey, to join Him in that work. So I actually believe uh, also uh, that there's an incentive for this uh, where he's saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I believe the incentive or the reward for us, the thing that will encourage us and spur us to work out our salvation is not the verse that where it says, work it out with fear and trembling. Because that... Um, and when you think about something that you've done that's of the uttermost importance and you prepare for it, and you get nervous. I can remember when I was in college and I was preparing for a recital and I was a music major, I was a trombone performance major, and I actually, at that time, I was not a believer. Um, I was 19 years old and was almost a believer. I didn't know it. <laughs> and I had to perform in front of people, and I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. I really had like a rejection issue, I think, from divorce, and was, uh, I had lots of emo emotional dysfunction from that. And so I just was afraid to be in front of people. And I remember getting my instrument and pulling it up, and I used to get so fearful that I would actually, rather than just take a breath, and you just, you know, you just got to, all you had to do is, and it, you know, the sound comes out. I couldn't do that. I was so frozen that I would actually stutter on the instrument. If you can actually believe that, because I, I know I've been on this stage here and <laughs> play guitar, but um, that was true before I was a believer. And so when I thought of that, though, I mean, I, there was fear involved, but it was also very important. And we think of when you're preparing for something that's important, with the idea that God is commanding you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling is because... Sanctification is the most important thing that you will deal with in life. It is the most important task at hand for us. Being holy. Be holy, for I am holy. And so the incentive for this, I think there's another incentive here uh, that stirs me and it's found in verse 9, which is not even in this passage. It says, if God is at work, or, I'm sorry, if God is at work in you to will and, and to uh, work his good pleasure, then he's not withholding anything from you. Paul says in verse 1 6 that, chapter 1, verse 6 of Philippians, that he who began a work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. It will be finished. He won't give up, which I think encourage us, encourages us in the most difficult of times to not give up on him. But what, what was Jesus' reward when he completed his work? Paul tells us to work out our salvation, but he gives Jesus as the example we just discussed the therefores. And so what was Jesus' reward for obedience? Because that same obedience that Jesus accomplished for us in the perfect life of righteousness and holiness that he lived is transferred and imputed to you who believe. When you believe on him, God, and call on him, God takes your sin, your filthy mouth, evil thoughts, unholy actions, unloving choices, selfishness. He places it on Jesus at the cross where he pours out his full 
wrath and justice on your sin. And Jesus obeyed his Father. You hear the struggle when he says, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And he became obedient, as this passage says, to the point of death. And then there's the therefore. Therefore he was highly exalted. And I think that this therefore applies to us in this situation. Paul's saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work in you to will and to work his good purpose. His purpose for Jesus was to go so that he would be obedient to the Father to the point of death and that living the perfect perfect, righteous life and holy life, pleasing to God, in good standing with God, transfers us to transfers that righteousness to us, but because he was obedient, he's rewarded and he's exalted to the right hand of the Father, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And that exaltation is in the promise of salvation for you and for me. It's the same promise. What we see Jesus rising, we have that same hope. So when Jesus is exalted to the Father's right hand and one day comes back, sanctification will be done. Sanctification will end at his return. It ends at death. Your soul is sanctified and made pure. If you're in Christ, it's made whole and you are pure. And that sanctification process, the process of God making you holy, is done. But your body dies. But when Jesus comes back, you're going to get the same glorified body that Jesus has. And we'll still see the wounds on his hands. So we can work and we can toil. Uh, but Psalm 21, 27 says, unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor in vain. And so I want to just briefly talk about, I think, what, what, what could be three responses maybe that I could have to this passage, the idea of working out my salvation. Just really briefly, um, the first one is, is really legalism. When Paul says, work out your salvation, I can think that um, I can attain this on my own. I can do this. He says, work out my salvation, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'll do my part. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do it. I don't, I'll do it on my own without trusting God, without depending on God, without leaning on God, without needing God. And that is exactly what Paul was talking about in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 12. He doesn't want that kind of righteousness. That's a self-made Righteousness, that's self-righteousness. It's legalism. And so, that doesn't work. We don't contribute anything to justification because it says that we are righteous. If you're in Christ, you're righteous by faith alone, by believing the promise. And so, there was no way for us to claim that we've done it. It's all his work. And so if we try to do this on our own, then what happens is it leads to self-righteous legalism. So if I say I've got it, um, what if I said I, I've got it, God's, God's the author, but I'm the finisher. Uh, God did his part. So it's not like I work sometimes, and then God is working when I'm not. And then when I am working, he's not. I was working all the time. And Paul actually warned the Galatians of having begun their salvation in faith. And then they tried to finish it on their own. And here's what he says, O oh, foolish, this is, uh, Galatians 3, uh, verse 1 and verse 2 and 3, if you want that. Um, o oh, foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? 
Having begun by the Spirit, are you now perfected in the flesh? We need God to be working, and we have to acknowledge God's work in the work of salvation, in the work of sanctification. So um, another, I think another danger for me to, to respond to this is, is to actually say, well, God's working, so I don't have to. Um, a kind of liberalism that he's going to do it all, and I don't have to. That is a very dangerous place to be. So I think sometimes we tend to walk the tightrope of how we're depending on God to work in us and how we're working. But there is a constant dependency. And so if we're not dependent on him, then that's a dangerous place to be because then we'll be in violation of this exact commandment that Paul's giving. I think another, another idea um, that we don't really see in Scripture, although I, I would say, I mean, this is a discussion if you've got questions about this too, is the idea of perfectionism too. Perfectionism. That somehow in this life, I can attain to perfection, and I will cease sinning. And if anyone thinks they've done that in here, I would give you the, the words of Hebrews, which says, the author of Hebrews, I, I think it's chapter 13, but it says, You've not yet resisted sin to the point of shedding blood. That's what we saw Jesus did, right? Resisted sin. He obeyed until he died. If you think you're perfect, I would say you're probably bleeding. Or you're dead. So I think although we see, well, do we see that God gives the, the command for things that we can't fulfill? Well, he gives commands to non-believers. He gives commands to the world. He has the same standard the same law. They'll be judged by the same judge. So yeah, he commands things that we can't do. So the idea that I can do it just because he said, be holy, for I am holy, and be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, um, I, th I think that really, really maybe that's just a misunderstanding of the, what those passages mean. It doesn't mean that I am perfect, uh, that I will be perfect in this life, but I do believe that, and the scripture teaches that, Sanctification is the process where God is making you more and more holy, but that process is not completed until death. Until death. So, um, so this is the idea that God is sovereignly working in the midst of our will um, is, is really mysterious um, to me. It, it is a deep mystery. And so God is sovereign in sanctification he, as he is in regeneration of our hearts or bringing us to life. He's sovereign in justification. And the fact that he's sovereign in sanctification and in in working our salvation as I work with him, I don't think in any way undermines the idea that we have to cooperate in some way with him, that there is still a call to obedience and that I have to respond in obedience and I have to work and strive and press on towards that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Because that's what Paul says, right? And so there's, a mis there's mystery at work in our actions, in our attitudes, in our desires, in our choices. The reality is that the purposes of God are being accomplished in the life of believers. And so, um, I want to take a look at a few passages that show our responsibility, man's res participation in sanctification, and then I want to look and see what Scripture says about God and his role in sanctification. So I think these are going to be up here. First one is Romans 8.13. We'll see. I can maybe go out of order. Okay, I'm just going to read it for you. Okay, so uh, the role of our man's participation in sanctification, Romans 8, 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Okay. Thank you. Since we have these promises, beloved, 
Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Galatians 5.22. I'm sorry, 5.25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, 8 through 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 3, 3. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And so, God somewhere is working and we participate. Here, is some, here are some verses that talks about God's role in sanctification. I want you to look at who, as we read these first three, who's doing the sanctifying work? Who is it? Hebrews 12, 9 through 10. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines for us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. Who's doing the sanctification there? Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with word, so that he might present to the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything, any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. He says in verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Make peace be multiplied to you. So in those three verses, we see the work of sanctification by all three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. So like I said earlier, this is a sovereign work of God, sanctification is. And yet, we still have to respond. We participate. I'm going to read one more. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who calls you. Oh, sorry. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. We, here we have that same idea that what God begins, he will finish. You know, as Paul goes on in these verses, he talks about a crooked and perverse generation. And he says, he actually gives them a concrete, I think a concrete example of what does it mean to work out your salvation. And the, the example he gives is grumbling. Do, he says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. And he tells why, right? So no matter what you do, whenever you do it, wherever you do it, however you do it, whatever you do, do it without grumbling. Do it without complaining. Because he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you what? Shine as lights in the world. And so Paul's giving us an example. What does it mean to work out my salvation here? I don't know why he chose grumbling and complaining. We see examples of the Israelites Uh, complaining and grumbling in the wilderness. And even Paul, 
says that that happened as a warning for us. I'll get to that in a minute. But I think maybe why grumbling? Why did he choose grumbling? Why is that the example he gave? Because sanctification is not just for you. As I said earlier, it's for, it's a corporate, it's a corporate work that God does. It's to be done together in community. God does it in community. His work is in community with the Trinity. Our work of sanctification also is most effective in community. And the purpose of that sanctification is that the glory of God would be on display for us in each other's lives, but also, as Paul mentions here, for the world. And Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. You see, if this work of working out our salvation is not done, it means that there are people who do not see the Lord. Paul gives grumbling as an example. And we might think complaining, grumbling, negativity, uh, that's not that bad. <laughs> it's, um, it's actually really serious. In some verse that I have, which would be 2 Corinthians 10, and I don't know where it is. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Okay. Paul gives, sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. He speaks of grumbling. He says, these things, it's talking about the Israelites who were delivered out of Egypt, wandered through the wilderness, grumbled, complained because they didn't have bread. They didn't have water. They didn't have comforts. Okay, they didn't have comforts, so they started grumbling. Now, I, th I think that maybe the grumbling that is happening there is different from, say, I've just had pain, therefore I'm expressing my pain. I think there's a way to have a faith-filled complaint to God of this is painful and, and not be grumbling as the Scripture talks about it. But I think there's a faithless complaining too, which in the book of Jude talks about complainers and says that those who are faithless are who are complainers who will be judged by God are like water. They're like uh, clouds that come through with the promise of rain, but they leave. They're like hidden reefs, coral reefs under an ocean that you're going to shipwreck on. And so here we see in um, 1 Corinthians 10, he says these about the Israelites, he says, these things happened to them as examples, meaning they're grumbling and what occurred. He said, but they were written down for our instruction, for you and me, in other words, on whom the end of the ages has come. He says, therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is common to man. So right um, before this passage, he talks about grumbling and says that that is the example for us that we might press on into Christ. And so that our light might shine before a dark, dying world and that we might reflect the glory of God in one another's lives. Mm -hmm.